The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is kind of an indirect mentor of mine, and I've been watching his stuff since 2012, since I discovered uh, macroeconomics and investing. He really needs no introduction. His name is Mike Maloney. Mike, welcome back to the show, my friend. Hey, George, how are you doing? I'm doing real well. Well, we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, The world is a very interesting place. I said back in 2020 that from a freedom and liberty standpoint, I thought that uh, I I really kind of look at things through that Lenin quote, which I'm sure you're familiar with when he said that there's decades that go by when nothing happens and weeks that go by when decades happen. And I think we, we saw that play out with our freedom and liberty. And I said in 2022 that I thought we'd see that same um, that same kind of quote play out with macroeconomics. And I think uh, that's exactly what we're seeing now. But you've had some incredible insights on your videos lately. Can you walk us uh, through some of those, specifically uh, the one regarding Ukraine and Russia and trying to get people to think through this clearly without using emotion? Well, emotion traps us and causes people to make bad decisions. It happens all the time. I mean, you know, when when the Bush administration was pushing the Iraq war, I bought it hook, line and sinker. (laughs) All the fictitious evidence that they produced and, and, uh, you know, they were trying to sell us something. And politicians are always trying to sell you something. That's how they get elected is selling you on ideas that they think you're going to like. Um, But Uh, That video was basically about uh, stepping back and taking a breath, calming down and gaining some perspective. And one of the things that I noticed, you know, you talked about uh, uh, freedom and liberty. Uh, Well, we lost a lot of it during the pandemic. It was just amazing. The amount of censorship that happened, the amount of, uh, (laughs) as we get closer and closer to the end of the pandemic here, we're finding out that a whole lot of the stuff that was labeled the misinformation was actually correct information. And the stuff that uh, was the official uh, stance uh, was actually the misinformation. Yeah, what I've been saying on Twitter, Mike, is today's science is is yesterday's misinformation. Yes, yeah, it's it's absolutely true now. And uh, um, it, the, the, uh, big tech and mass media uh, now has this control over us to where, you know, that video opened with basically everybody is being manipulated these days. Mm-hmm. You're being manipulated. I'm being manipulated. The audience is being manipulated. Right. And it's sort of our job to try to sort of calm down and then uh, uh, discern for ourselves what's really going on by trying to strip away as much misinformation as possible. And the way that I've found to do that is you have to look at both sides, both sets of propaganda. It's like, you know, most of the people that um, uh, that point at uh, uh, Robert Malone, Dr. Robert Malone and Peter Pierre Corey and, and, all of these other people that are on one side of the pandemic issue, uh, they point at them and they say, they're crazy. There's these lunatic uh, conspiracy people and they uh, have to be blocked from all media. Nobody can know what they say. But the people that actually watch them, those people that say that have not watched the videos. They didn't uh, uh, watch the uh, Senate uh, discussions uh, with, uh, Uh, Rob, is it Rob Johnson, Senator Ron Johnson? They didn't watch that. Uh, They they didn't watch Joe Rogan, the appearance on Joe Rogan that everybody got all up in a roar about. They just take little snippets. So the people that are that are uh, saying that they have to be banned are the people that haven't seen the whole thing. They've only seen a snippet here and a snippet there. Oh, that's misinformation. Uh, And uh, we're doing the same thing with the Ukraine. Uh, we're developing our opinions based on sound bites. That's always dangerous and it opens you up for manipulation. And so what I do, be, before I made any comments on this, uh, you know, what I wanted to do was to show an old video. 
I did a presentation back in 2015 at the Silver Summit, but I believe it was in San Francisco. Uh, there's a couple of mistakes in it. I usually don't, I, I try my hardest not to have any mistakes. I don't like generating or propagating misinformation. Uh, that is something that, that uh, is, I agonize over these things. But I made a presentation showing uh, there, there was a video that had come out that was not carried on the mainstream media. And it was uh, Vladimir Putin, you know, the president of the Russian Federation, uh, giving a press conference about how the world is being dragged toward nuclear war. This is back in 2015 that I found this video and I couldn't believe that it wasn't aired anywhere on the Western media. Mm. And basically, uh, you know, with the, with the snippets from that and then showing the progression of uh, NATO, our expansion of NATO to, you know, before this video, I haven't done it. Maybe somebody can do this uh, for me and put it in the comments on your video. But I didn't measure the bor our border with Canada and Russia's border uh, from uh, Estonia and Latvia all the way across the, you know, you, I believe Belarus is not uh, going to be a native NATO member. But when you add up all of the NATO countries, if the Ukraine is included, this is going to be very much like Russia making Canada an ally and being able to put military bases in Canada. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we freaked out when, uh, when there was going to be Russian military bases in the Western Hemisphere, when, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, and it brought us very close to nuclear war. We learned nothing from history. And here we are again, but the shoe is on the other foot. We're uh, promoting uh, this, you know, and I don't want to alienate any of your viewers. Uh, what I want your viewers to do is uh, to sort of step back and take a breath and say, well, regardless of what my opinion is now, let's look at both sides. So in getting ready for uh, that video, I went and read a bunch of articles on Pravda and Russia Today, and uh, I wanted to see the official propaganda that is being put out that their population reads, mm -hmm. and the official propaganda that we are being hammered over the head with every day with our big media and right. stuff. When you do this and you see the two different sides, and they, they are quite divergent, and then, and they're, they're pointing at each other and they're saying, he said this, no, this is his fault. Strip out all the information that is different. Whatever is common to both sides is probably the root cause of the, the problem. Uh, you know, we've got a, a gas pipe, Nord Stream 2, I believe it is, that uh, is doubling the volume of the Nord Stream pipeline that goes under the North Sea uh, to Germany. And uh, that will give Russia a huge lever that they can pull and they can throttle back. You know, if they're supplying a, 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 an immense volume of uh, energy to Europe, and then they can just throttle it back on, at any time, they've got control over Europe. Well, we don't want that. Uh, Putin doesn't want uh, US military bases and NATO countries all along his border. Uh, that is a giant threat. And from his point of view, he cannot let it happen. And so I made this video back in 2015. Unbeknownst to me, there was another uh, video made by uh, Professor, I can't remember his first name, but uh, Merzheimer. He had made a presentation. It looks like it's an hour and 20 minutes long. Everybody should go and watch this. It's not, it's like uh, 40 minutes long and then the rest is questions and answers. And I watch it at two times the speed. <laughs> I'm trying to consume as much information as possible. So for all of your viewers, any uh, YouTube video, you click the little gear in the corner and you can select the speed. And depending on how the person speaks, uh, you can get very intelligible information at 1.25, five times, 1.75, or two times speed. And you can save yourself a lot of time and consume a lot more information. Yeah, I sound way smarter at two times. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, if I watch my own videos, which I do, rare, I only do that for editing. 
you know, yeah. the, the editors send them, send me the clips before I approve them. I always listen to them in double time. And I said, I sound pretty smart. And I listen to them in the whole <laughs> time. And then I go back to sounding like a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So anyway, it's all about gaining perspective. And uh, I made a suggestion. I don't know uh, how old you are, but uh, you may or may not have heard Donovan's uh, Universal Soldier which uh, it, he didn't write the song, but it's an absolute masterpiece of an anti-war song. Well, if and the end line is, he's the universal soldier and he really is to blame. His orders come from far away no more. They come from here and there and you and me and brothers, can't you see, this is not the way to put the end to war. So that's the uh, end lyric. And uh, the thing is, if you substitute voter, or follower, because it's the, the biggest problem. It what will doom mankind is the follow the leader mentality. Uh, we all have this follow the leader mentality where every four years we hold some popularity contest so we can find some guy that you know isn't too difficult to look at and doesn't put his foot in his mouth in a three word sentence. Well. Going back to the Bush administration, that didn't quite <laughs> happen, but uh, uh, sometimes he would put a, his foot in his mouth in a three word sentence. Um, but uh, it's, we, we do this and we elect them to tell us how to run our lives. And that part of staying in power is you have to keep your population, your own constituency, scared of somebody else that you're going to protect them from that or a virus or this or that there's a whole you know you come up with this endless stream of threats to keep the population off kilter and you're the one that's going to save them uh or you sell them on a whole bunch of uh programs and ideas where they're going their, their lives are going to be so much better because everybody's going to get a bunch of free stuff you're going to you're you don't have to worry. You're going to be able to live for free. Uh, elect me and I'll do that. I'll tax these people, take part of their lifetimes and uh, distribute them among you. And you're going to be a lot better. And since uh, the vast majority of the population, if, imagine a whole bunch of people trying to get into Disneyland and every one of them says, oh, he's richer than me. He'll pay for it. And then the next, oh, he's richer than me, then he'll pay for it. And then the last guy, you know, what, what truly is fair? Uh, you know, this, the, I view like entrance into society as buying a ticket into Disneyland. <laughs> what is fair? Should we all be paying our own way? Or should the person that produces the most, uh, should everything be taken from them so that all of us can get in for free, the non-producers and such? Anyway, it's, it's all about stepping back and gaining perspective, and then making up your own mind on what's really going on, because we're constantly being lied to, and we need to try and see through the lies. And if your audience really wants to gain some true perspective, and this goes for not just um, the Ukraine situation or political stuff that's going on, but you know, if you've got a tragedy in the family, or if you've lost a job, or if you've been diagnosed with cancer, it doesn't matter what it is. Watch Pale Blue Dot. Uh, this is an absolute uh, masterpiece uh, by um, Carl Sagan. And it gives you a perspective on life. And it's only, it's four minutes long. The best version is about five and a half minutes long. Um, it's... Uh, it's titled something like the the best video on humanity or something like that. Uh, but you know, various people have taken this audio clip and put in a bunch of images. And this one, I mean, every time I, I, I I've been watching it since I made my video, I told people in there, watch this every morning for a week to try and gain some real perspective on our place in the universe and how precious life is. Mm. And I have been actually doing that myself. I watch it every day. And, uh, you know, one of my viewers said he watched it. You know, I got a lot of people that uh, sent in comments saying that they watched it and they cried. It's the most important video that they've ever seen. 
And, uh, and I find myself when I watch it, and I've watched it more than 50 times, less than 100 over my, you know, the past uh, 10 years or whatever, since I first discovered it. And uh, I quiver inside and my eyes tear up still after seeing it that many times. It truly gives you perspective. I would urge all of your viewers to watch that. But gain some perspective and make up your own mind was my message. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I was listening to Russell Brand the other day, who has interesting takes sometimes. And yeah, he's a bit of a socialist, but he's got interesting takes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, again, but I try to do what you do. I try to listen to all sides and just hear everyone that, that I think is trying to come from a place of intellectual honesty and intellectual curiosity and kind of put that together to try to formulate some sort of opinion. But one thing that he said that I really agree with, and I think is lost on a lot of people on social media right now, is he said to understand a situation or to explain a situation doesn't mean that you condone the situation and right. uh, people and just you know what you're saying there people need to understand you, or what you're not saying there is you're not saying hey i think it's great that putin or i can see why putin is justified in going into ukraine and starting a war or you know doing this invasion you're not saying that he's justified in doing that you're just trying no, to not your side is justified yeah you're just trying to understand why well, what, why, what is the propaganda acknowledging that it is propaganda, but then what most people have to do and what they're not doing is acknowledging that we are being fed propaganda by our media as well. It, what's, what's staggering to me is that so many people saw the propaganda with COVID, but yet, the, and, and, and they were pushing back against the media, but yet now all of a sudden, when the media is saying something that fits their worldview or narrative, now all of a sudden it's not propaganda, it's the absolute truth. But wait a minute, it's, that's the same media that has been lying yeah. to you and using propaganda against you to take away your freedoms and liberties. And it, you know, a lot, right along with the politicians and the global elite, that, that's the same media that's been doing this for the last two years. So you think all of a sudden they had, they had a, a come to church or something, you know, or they had this, they had this epiphany where, oh my gosh, we've been wrong this whole time. We've been using this propaganda, but now this situation is so serious. We're going to abandon the propaganda and just start reporting the straight news. It, it blows right. away. Yeah. You know, people need to realize that uh, governments are nothing but gangs. And if you know West Side Story, it's the sharks and the jets. Mm -hmm. And that's right now, that's us and Russia. Uh, you know, I come from Los Angeles and there back in the uh, 70s and 80s and so on. I don't know if it's still going on, but there were the Crips and the Bloods, the yeah, two yeah. gangs, and they're having turf wars. And there's, you know, uh, gunfights and dead bodies and, and uh, these turf wars to gain a little ground. When Carl Sagan says in Pale Blue, Blue Dot, you know, think of the rivers of blood that were spilled so that some, I can't remember all of the words, but some leader in his moment of glory can become the temporary master of a fraction of a dot. Because what this is all about, pale blue dot, is when they sent out Voyager, the first uh, big exploration, the first thing that we sent the, out that left our solar system, uh, Carl Sagan asked if they could turn it back after it had passed Saturn and take a picture of the earth. That's what you're seeing, is the viewpoint as Voyager is leaving the solar system, you're seeing our home. When he talks about everyone that has ever lived, lived on that pixel, that little pale blue dot. Right. And uh, it truly does give you some perspective. Um, so we need to realize that the problem isn't uh, the, isn't, Russia or the United States, uh, the problem is leaders. Uh, we elect these people that stay in power by keeping us afraid and they get in these situations and they're all sociopaths anyway. If they're seeking public office, you know, the highest public office in the land, especially, they believe that they are entitled to rule other people's lives, that they're entitled 
that, that they are more well equipped to make decisions for you than you are uh, to, to show you how to run your life. And, and, uh, um, and so this follow the leader mentality is uh, what could end mankind one day. Uh, it's something that I've talked about for many, many years, and I worry about it because we're watching, uh, you know, uh, several leaders posturing against each other. Who's going to win? They're both, you know, and there is a solution. Uh, if, if we say, okay, uh, let's both work to try and make Ukraine a neutral state, but we've been selling the Ukraine on this idea of becoming a NATO member and, and uh, maybe part of the EU for years. And so now they've bought it and they think that that's going to happen. Uh, Putin can't let that happen. Uh, we're th threatened uh, with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline giving such control over Europe. Well, they can trade those two things. Pipeline, you know, even though it's completed, it, it does it, you know, we end the pipeline, make uh, the Ukraine a neutral state, uh, that is a buffer zone. And I think that would be the end of this thing. But three days ago, uh, Putin escalated the, uh, their nuclear defense to the highest level of readiness. So they're basically on our version of DEFCON 5 right now. This is a dangerous situation. Right. We all need to do that stepping back and taking a breath and gaining perspective. So I just urge all of your viewers to um, please do that. Once you've done that, once you've looked at, if, if you look at both sides, all the official propaganda, strip out the differences, look at the core issues, make up your own mind, then help other people do that. Because right now, everybody's letting their emotions rule. Your emotions, whether it's uh, investment or whether it's politics, your emotions will, anybody that trades on emotions knows what I'm talking about. If you let your emotions make your trades, you're going to go broke. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and, and I, I see the media trying to get people whipped up into an emotional frenzy now with this situation in the exact same way they did it with COVID back mm -hmm. in, in, in 2020 and in 2021. And one, a question that I'd love to get your opinion on, Mike, is you, you talked earlier about uh, how uh, Dr. Malone and McCullough and uh, Corey, you know, everything that comes out of their mouth, the media says, well, this is disinformation, this is misinformation, and we need to ban these people from social media because we can't afford, their views are so dangerous that we can't afford to have other people hear their dissenting view. Do you think we'll get to that point with Russia, where if you have a dissenting view, like what we just talked about, that this will be banned from YouTube or this will be demonetized because they see it just as dangerous as the quote unquote disinformation about COVID? Well, it's already happening. Um, Russia Today, RT, which is what Max Kaiser is on, is now they're, they're making, making it so that you can't view that in the United States. Now, if you look back in history, whenever censorship happens, it's always the censorers that are on the wrong side, not the people being censored. That's right. I mean, almost always throughout history, when there's something that is a threat to whoever is in power, that's when they don't want anybody to know about it. When it comes to scientific debate or political debate, openness is what uh, allows us to come to the proper conclusion and allows us to heal the wounds between the two different sides. Uh, when you shut down one side completely, the wounds never heal and you never come to a truthful conclusion. Yeah, yeah. You know, another thing I'm, I'm concerned with is, and I don't know if you've seen this in the news, but they've started to, to ban innocent Russians uh, just because they were born in Russia. You know, the, the Canadian Hockey League, I read yesterday, uh, they're now not allowing the 16 and 17 year old kids there to try out for the league um, wow. that were born in Russia. Uh, a politician in California uh, suggested that we, should, uh, that we should ban all Russian students from university. Unbelievable. We learned nothing from the Japanese internment exactly. camps during World exactly. War II. Exactly. Unbelievable how, uh, you know, 
people need to have empathy for one another and try and uh, think, well, how, you know, what if I was in his shoes or her shoes? Yeah, but the pushback that you get there, Mike, as well, it's not as bad, you know, you're feeling sorry for them, but the, the Ukrainians are getting bombed and, you know, they're, they're at, at war here. And so they've got it a lot worse. That, that's kind of the, the simple argument that you hear. Well, we right. should be banning these people from playing hockey because then they'll go back and they'll get mad at Putin. And by the way, banning them from hockey isn't as bad as the Ukrainians being bombed. That, that's the, the simplest right. argument you hear. Yeah, well, I would suggest that people uh, do a, a search on the internet for uh, Professor Merzheimer's uh, video titled Why the Ukraine is the West's Fault. That's, and that's from 2015. So if there's evidence that, that led up to somebody making this conclusion back in 2015, and then I saw that video of Putin warning that we're being, the world is being drug in this direction and we have to stop this. And he's trying, he says, you know, I don't know how to get through to you anymore. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't like Putin. <laughs> I don't like leaders though. I have a great suspicion of any political leader and it doesn't matter what side they're on. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, I've never liked Putin. I always thought he was sort of a creepy, evil guy. But uh, basically, he has his point of view and his interests. And in order to make any type of rational conclusion on what's going on there, you have to understand that and then our interests and, and Western Europe's interests. It takes a little bit of effort. Yeah. But you most people that are two, lazy. And what? you got to understand that two wrongs don't make a right. And by right, three rights make a left. By hurting innocent Russians, you're not going to help ukrainians and 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 let's think about that slippery slope because if you're going to argue that we can do anything to an innocent russian and it's justified because it's not as bad as what they're doing to ukrainians well where does that end do we put them in jail do we beat them uh senseless and and but well, why not that's not as bad as what the ukrainians are dealing with you know and maybe that would you know if listen right. if if banning them from a hockey league or university is going to motivate them to go back and fight against or not vote for Putin in the future, well, beating them or throwing them in jail, well, that's really going to motivate them to go back and stick it to Putin. I mean, it's th that that's the the, right. the the level of irrationality that we're dealing with right now. Well, you know, that's actually the op. There's a backlash toward the people that are beating them. So if if we treat them poorly, then they would probably end up supporting uh, exactly. stance even more. Uh, that's what happened in Iraq, and that's what's happened in Afghanistan, and we, we just don't learn from and, history. And, and the unvaccinated, Mike, it, it's the exact same thing. Remember, right. in, the, in, that, in the United States, and you're in Puerto Rico, I mean, you, you've yeah. dealt with that. We're starting to treat Russians the exact same way, uh, and it, it's just absolute madness. It goes back to those Japanese camps that you were referring yeah. to before that no one learns from history. Right. Yeah. And the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they're just on and on and on. You know, uh, it is a dangerous situation, but more than uh, politically and the potential for the nuclear war, that is a tail risk still, I believe. But it is something that could actually happen from this. Um, uh, now, Ukraine is a very, very complex situation because it's a very, very complex country. There are sections of the Ukraine that where the majority language is Russian, and there are sections that would like to uh, break off and become part of Russia. And so you've got their own population in a tug of war. Uh, they really didn't need this. And anybody that attacks any country, I believe, is always wrong. We were, we were wrong when we attacked you know, but we were sold a bill of goods on weapons of mass destruction when we attacked Iraq. Yeah. Uh, um, and that <laughs> this type of propaganda, you have to go and look at both sides and strip out all of the stuff that's different to find uh, what the the foundation is of both uh, opinions of both sets of propaganda. When you strip out the differences, 
you probably have something a bit closer to the truth to go off of. But the economic consequences that we're going to experience here, uh, I am very worried about what's going to happen to the global economy in the coming years. Yeah, let's go through that, Mike. Yeah, let's go through that, please. Uh, right. I'd and, love to hear and, your thoughts on what happens to the U.S. economy, the global economy, the European economy. Uh, we know what's happening to the Russian economy. How does China play into this? What are your thoughts there? Well, I don't know the exact percentage, but uh, Russia supplies a decent percentage of uh, Europe's energy. And uh, energy, you know, Chris Martinson just did a, a video that I suggest people watch uh, from, uh, you know, just I think yesterday, uh, where he shows very clearly that energy and GDP are in inextricably linked. They are in lockstep as, as GDP grows, energy consumption grows, or as energy consumption grows, GDP grows. Yep. You know, is it the chicken or the egg? We don't really know, but in order to have more GDP, you've got to use more energy. If there's less energy, there's going to be less GDP. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've got a world where everything except precious metals and, uh, you know, I don't know how to truly value cryptos. So that is, uh, I, I believe that uh, with the, uh, you know, I'm 66 years old. So uh, I'm from a generation that uh, does not trust virtual assets, assets that don't exist in three dimensions. Uh, however, I embraced cryptos back in 2014. I see precious metals and cryptos as allies in freedom, mm. uh, individual freedom, yep. and not, not necessarily freedom for a country, but your individual liberty uh, can be bolstered. And, and how well you sleep at night can be bolstered by uh, having uh, cryptos and precious metals. And I believe anybody that's 100% on one side or the other uh, is not really looking. I mean, cryptos, you need uh, the internet to be working for them to be there and have value. Uh, with gold and silver, you could transact with somebody personally if you've got a gold coin. Uh, so as far as a survival tool, and as far as uh, guarding us, shielding us from governments inflating currency supplies and the banking sector inflating currency supplies, thereby stealing wealth from us by diluting the currency supply. Uh, these are both protections against that. Uh, but uh, one is highly portable, uh, very secure, the, the, the cryptos. Uh, as long as you didn't, nobody gets your private key, uh, highly portable, very uh, secure and easy to transact anywhere on earth. The other one uh, is not quite as portable, but still very portable, holds a lot of value in a small space, but it isn't reliant on power and the internet to be there. And uh, what we just discovered, I mean, the Russians are discovering, you know, I have been, and I hope you join me here. I have been making a distinction between currency and money since 2007. And I've been, you know, the US dollar, the Russian ruble, especially like the Russian ruble, the Russians are discovering right now that the, the current ruble that they use not is money. not money. It did not <laughs> store value. The value of it has just dropped in just a few days it by massive amounts. It is not money, it's currency. There's a big difference. Uh, currency has to be a medium of exchange, a unit of account, it's got to be portable, divisible, durable, and fungible. The units have, you know, if you, you loan me a $20 bill, I can pay you back a 10, a five, and five ones, and you don't care. Uh, that's fungibility, interchangeability. Money has to be all of those plus a store of value over long periods of time. It's got to maintain value. It can't, so with true money, you don't have inflation. In fact, you would have a slow mile deflation due to the advancements in technology and productivity that humans yep. have. Uh, so we constantly do more with less. Uh, right now, you know, if you go back into the depression, single family median price home was a couple thousand bucks. It's, you know, 150,000, I mean, uh, 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 1,500 th to 3,000. And now it's uh, 150 to 300,000. Was it the home that changed or was it the currency? 
<laughs> it was the currency. And we got back then, it would take, uh, you know, a group of 30 guys, you know, those old Victorian houses and stuff. They take 30 guys uh, um, uh, a, a year to build a, a fine house like that. Now, 30 guys slap together a few hundred homes in a housing tract in the same period of time. And so uh, a home, if we had a fixed currency supply, should maybe cost you a thousand bucks. Now, you got to realize you're not going to be making several hundred thousand dollars per year. You're, you know, you're going to be making, uh, um, you know, I, th I think my mother's father during the Great Depression made 60 bucks a month or something like that and supported a family of four. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's this is also about gaining perspective, but it's very, very important for everybody to start under, understanding the difference between currency and money, because currency is a scheme to steal your true wealth, which is, you know, you put a bunch of time and effort into uh, making a living, and then the government takes a percentage, and then the banking sector takes another percentage as a tax that's called inflation yeah. by diluting the currency supply. So let's go back to our, our good friend, Chris Martinson. What he was saying there is, and I just spoke with Art Berman the other day. I'm not sure if you know Art, but uh, you'd love to talk to him. He's a geologist, a oil specialist. And he always says that oil and energy, it is the economy. And uh, this is pretty much what Chris was saying. So if we have less energy because we're cutting off or sanctioning Russia, let's just assume, then that means uh that could be deflationary but instead of using the word deflationary there what i like to use is less economic activity uh because yeah. if in that environment you know let's just assume gold or um, oil excuse me spikes to 150 or 200 dollars a barrel because there's less of it we could go through this uh economic scenario that's highly inflationary but yet uh, where real GDP growth, global GDP growth, or economic activity decreases. Yes. So I, I think most people, when they look at uh, deflation or inflation, they look at it as either or, uh, but you can have deflationary pressures, meaning less economic activity, while at the same time, you have consumer prices increasing substantially because of that main input being energy doubling in price. And that right. can be gold, obviously, in Bitcoin. And you can have inflation. Uh, yeah, you can have massive inflation with uh, collapsing GDP. Look at Venezuela, yeah. <laughs> Zimbabwe, Weimar, Germany. Right. Uh, and what's interesting is the end of all hyperinflations is the ultimate deflation. Because every day you have more and more and more currency until one day you have none of it. The yeah. minute the people turn, their, when they lose trust, faith in the currency, and they turn to something else, all of that currency, whenever you see a picture of currency in the street and somebody sweeping it in the gutter from some hyperinflation, like is happening in, in Venezuela, like happened in Zimbabwe, like happened in Weimar, Germany, uh, that is the end stage of, uh, that's the deflationary part of the hyperinflation. Yeah, I uh, it's, thought of it that way. That's really interesting that your currency inflates inflates until one day, it has the ultimate deflation because there's right. zero left. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mike, I value think that got cut I from my book. That was a uh, part of a chapter that I uh, wrote for my book back in, I wrote that back in 2006, I think, or 2005. Yeah. Mike, you said that you don't know how to value Bitcoin. Uh, how do you value gold and silver? Like, how do you personally do yeah. it? Uh, there's things like the Dow gold ratio. So you're uh, taking the stock market going back into the uh, late 1800s and you're comparing it to gold and eliminating the currency by dividing uh, the stock market with gold or vice versa. And uh, you see its value of purchasing power of real stuff. And then there's uh, gold versus the currency supply. Mm. Uh, so you've got the uh, quantity of gold and the quantity of currency uh, and then you've got the price of the currency which is uh you know when you divide them uh you're seeing whether the currency is having more purchasing power uh at sometimes or 
And what you see is that throughout history, uh, uh, currency or the stock market will uh, gain in purchasing power while, and I call this a wealth cycle. Uh, they'll gain in purchasing power for a, a number of years and gold will be losing purchasing power measured against that. Uh, it buys less and less and less. And then if that continue, for instance, you know, since 2001, Gold has been, uh, with, with the exception of cryptocurrencies, gold has been the number one performing asset class since 2001. The stock markets are up 150 or 200% since 2000. Uh, gold is up about 600% over that same time period. And so it's out, so the stock market, every, everybody thinks it's going up, but measured in gold, it's selling at a 66% discount from where it was in the year 2000. Um, uh, so stocks have been getting cheaper measured in gold, not more expensive. Now, um, uh, this has little ups and downs along the way, and gold has been in what I call a mid-cycle correction since 2011. I don't consider the 2011 to 2015 pullback a bear market, even though it is greater than 20%, I consider it to be the same pullback that we had uh, from uh, the uh, last day of 74 or first day of 75 until I believe it was August of 76 when gold fell from about uh, 200 back to just under 200 to 103. Before uh, going to 800. Exactly. It went to 800 in, I can't remember, uh, it was just, you know, you're talking about the end of 76 and by January of 1980, it was 850. Mm -hmm. uh, so huge, huge gains. I consider the 70s bull market in precious metals one bull market with a mid-cycle correction that flushed out all of the weak hands, the people that, but the thing is with precious metals, this is the foundation, uh, this is money not currency. Everything else is like stacked on top of this. There's a reason that most central banks have gold and they don't, you know, some of the Western central banks have sold gold, but the rest of the world's central banks either uh, never had it or they've got it now uh, and they aren't selling or they've got it now and they've been buying over the past. And a lot of them have been buying, especially like Russia. They've been one of the largest accumulators uh, for quite a, uh, quite a number of years now, mm -hmm. and it's going to serve them well. This is the thing that can't evaporate. And uh, Nor can oil. Huh? Nor can oil. Right, right. And so um, the oil exports, they're going to have to, they'll, they'll probably end up having to shift a lot of this to China, and they're not going to trust the West as much anymore. Um, it's a bad situation that we're in. But I do expect that you're going to see uh, a big problem in the world economy in the coming years, and people have to get ready for it. Uh, I uh, recently, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, bought a ranch up in the mountains. I've got my own river, uh, and so I've got a water supply, and it's there is uh, no farming or grazing or even trails between the highest point in Puerto Rico and my farm. So this, this is pristine water, pristine air, and I've got solar panels and Tesla power walls. So I'm going completely off the grid and uh, we are already planting up there. So uh, <laughs> I am trying to do something where I'm growing really healthy food for myself. In Puerto Rico, you discover that uh, the uh, society here uh, doesn't particularly care for vegetables. <laughs> I'm somebody that needs a lot of broccoli and spinach and kale. And I'm laughing like. because I've, I've lived there before, so I know exactly yeah. what you're saying. Right. It's, it's all fried meat. plantains don't do it for you, Mike. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 plantains, rice, and meat, right? So starch, starch and meat. And uh, I just, my body just needs a lot of vegetables. And so I, we bought all these um, seeds that were engineered in Florida. So they're engineered for hot, humid clients, climates. Uh, my temperature up there is always uh, 10 degrees lower. So it's somewhere between eight and 15 degrees 
lower than in, in San Juan where I'm at now. Uh, and so uh, we should be able to grow broccoli and asparagus, and spinach and, and things that they don't grow in Puerto Rico. One of the things I wanna do is you know, um, uh, be able to supply local markets and things like that uh, with. So that's sort of a side venture, but it's also my escape plan. It yeah. is just beautiful up there. Uh, and having your own river and uh, there's a portion of it where I can see the north coast and the south coast of Puerto Rico from one spot. That's where I'm going to build my house. I'm going to sit in front of a campfire, grilling a bison steak you know, in New York <laughs> uh, and with a beer in my hand and uh, that spectacular view. So. Yeah. <laughs> I want to I want to point out to my listeners that there are a lot of very smart, wise people that I know in my network doing the exact same thing, uh, whether it's yeah. you, whether it's Mark Moss, whether it's Lynette Zhang, uh, Mike Dillard, uh, Kiyosaki, uh, Kenny McElroy, they're all doing the exact same thing. So that in and of itself, I think, should make most people kind of take pause and saying, okay, mm -hmm. these people are really, really smart. Uh, why are they doing this? And, and what can I learn from it? Yeah, the problem here has been supply chain disruptions, uh, things like solar water heaters, doors and windows. I mean, we're about to get all of our doors and windows. I mean, I found this, uh, we, we actually were driving through all of the greenery because this, was a this farm was abandoned after the hurricane. And the greenery, even on the roads, had grown up eight feet tall. So you just drive through it in this little farm vehicle, four-wheel drive farm vehicle. It's a John Deere. And the greenery is just falling down right in front of you. And my farm manager is driving along and he goes, bam! <laughs> and he hits something and get out, gets out. And he starts pulling back the vines and there's a cement wall there. Oh, geez. and he keeps on pulling back the vines and he found his house <laughs> <laughs> and he lives in there now there's no doors and windows so he, he's it's got solar power and high-speed internet but no doors and windows so he lives in it in a tent <laughs> yeah you got to prioritize right Mike? By, in a month we will have we've got the door the the windows are done uh the doors are being made finally uh actually the doors are done for his house um uh my house the doors and windows are done so my house then <laughs> i added on to my little house but uh it was this super solid structure made 80 years ago that was actually used for for housing goats <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you're the, the floors were covered with uh uh something i don't want to say <laughs> but it's, you know, it's all been pressure washed yeah uh, but uh i go up there and i sleep in this little house that was built for poor people. Some contractor built like hundreds of these up in the mountains, same cookie cutter floor plan, two tiny little bedrooms, a main room that's, you know, your uh, dining room, living room, uh, whatever, and a kitchen and no indoor bathroom. Uh, when I added <laughs> a, a master bath and a kitchen, it doubled the square footage of the house. <laughs> and I added a two car garage that is bigger than the original house. <laughs> but that, and that's my that's base funny. camp. Well, I, uh, uh, I plan on, you know, on my mountaintop, it gets pretty windy up there. And I plan on uh, building a temporary structure to be able to camp up there and experience it where I can see both sides of the island from one spot. Mm. So, um, but yeah, we're going all solar and all of these smart people that you, you mentioned, they're all trying to get ready yeah. uh, uh, for something that they see coming at them and they don't know when it's going to arrive. Right. And all of us, even though I'm heavily invested in cryptos and precious metals, I pray the moment doesn't come. I don't want gold to go to 40,000 bucks an ounce. I don't want Bitcoin at uh, 150, 300 thousand dollars an ounce. Five, I mean, a coin, 500 thousand a Bitcoin, uh, and uh, you know, I'm I've got several different cryptos, uh, and um, I mean, it's great in a temporary run-up to be able to sell some of this and turn it into 
uh, solar panels and I'm going to put in some hydroelectric because I've got one pond uh, and in a very short distance, uh, a, a large pond with a constant water feed from the side of the mountain. And in a very short distance, a more than 200 foot uh, elevation change. Uh, and uh, I can put in a hydroelectric there. And I can even use that pond as a battery, put in a bunch of solar panels, pump water back up to the pond in the daytime. And yeah, but Mike, I want to point out, I want to highlight something you just said there that I want the viewers to pay attention to. And you said that I, I don't want my gold to go to $40,000 an ounce. I don't want my Bitcoin to go to $500,000 a coin. Yeah. The reason is, folks, because at the end of the day, um, I would argue that wealth isn't even money. Uh, wealth is goods. No, and it's, not. it's goods and yes, services sir. and productivity. And I think right. what Mike is saying there, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, is that in a world where gold is $40,000 an ounce or Bitcoin is 500,000, there is a hell of a lot less stuff. Therefore, well, if, the, if, the if that happens 50 down. years from now and it's a slow progression, it's well, just I'm talking about the next couple of years. But if it happens in just a couple of years, it means that the world is a very different place. That's right. And you probably won't be able to buy something like a solar panel unless it's something. You'd be, it means that a lot of companies are out of business. It yep. means that yep. uh, the whole global GDP has slowed down. Uh, it means that, uh, you know, if it's because of inflation of the currency supply, it means that wealth is being stolen from the poor and middle class and, tra and transferred to uh, people that derive their wealth by their, their, their stock portfolios. Uh, and the Federal Reserve is responsible for it, but it's, it's theft nonetheless. Um, so uh, I, I just don't want, I wanna see a world that is fair and equitable and prosperous. Yeah, that's, right. that's the world that I'm trying to help create. Yeah, and, and to get there, to your point, we need sound money and we need smaller government, whether it's smaller Russian government or smaller U.S. government. <laughs> we need smaller government. Yes, uh, here in Puerto Rico, uh, there. when you look, at least Wikipedia, I believe, says 23.4% of the people derive their income from the government somehow. So that's either you know somebody working directly for the government or somebody that's got a private business that contracts to clean the government buildings or something like that. Uh, if your income is being derived through taxation, uh, then uh, if there's no society that's really successful on the planet, once you pass 18%, it's just too many people that aren't actually providing a real product or service that people would willingly open up their wallets and buy. When you go into any government agency, next time, <laughs> I just got my driver's license renewed. Oh, in in nice. Puerto Rico, you've got to have your original birth certificate your original social security card and past a certain age, I had to have a notarized letter from my cardiologist. So it took three days of my life to renew my driver's license. And then when I get it, it says that it's not an official ID. It can't be used for identification purposes. So I can't use this to fly back and forth to the United States. They won't let me back into Puerto Rico. <laughs> And so it's because my passport was uh, uh, had expired. And so now I got to renew my passport and then go and get my driver's license again. Yeah, right. And in each place, there's a bunch of people that are being paid and they're being paid uh, better than the private sector pays somebody for a similar job. Right. That all comes out of taxation. So they're imposing all of this, uh, these, they're making you use up a whole whole bunch of you know i was amazed i was going to move to the state of washington i leased a place up there i was going to move my business up there i walked in to get a washington driver's license and i walked out 15 minutes later with and in california it would take at least four hours it's it's government run in california well here it takes three days uh it's it's and it's government run here uh in the state of washington they subcontract it out to private industry. Then I went to register at a uh, 2011 Tesla Roadster and a 2012 Tesla Model S. And uh, I went to register them and I walked in with the titles and I had paid cash for them. So there's no liens on them. And 
they gave me plates and I walked out, it was 10 minutes to register two cars that weren't even in the state of Washington. They were in Los Angeles. Yeah. And I registered, them at, at, it was unbelievable the difference between private industry trying to be efficient and make a profit at, at, at a far lower cost, they're turning a profit. And then what government does for you. Anybody that thinks that government is, a, is the solution just think about what you're purchasing from government the next time you're in traffic. <laughs> you're sitting in stop and go traffic. This is the product that government delivers. Yeah, there you go. All right, Mike, I know I've already kept you way too long. For my viewers who want to find out more about what you do, uh, where can they go? Uh, they can go to goldsilver.com or uh, uh, Mike Maloney, Gold Silver, or maybe it's Gold Silver, Mike Maloney. Just uh, um, you can uh, on YouTube, just put in Mike Maloney or Hidden Secrets of Money. It's a series that I did that was shot in 17 countries. We were uh, trying to originally, it was supposed to be for PBS. Uh, so these are not your average YouTube videos. No, they're not. They're so incredible. Cost like a half million dollars to produce. We put them up on YouTube for free. Uh, then, you know, and the way we fund it is I do have a, a precious metals dealership, goldsilver.com, but my method of marketing is to pay it forward, basically, produce high quality information, give it away, uh, and some people then trust you and they come and buy from you if they think that they want gold or silver. And uh, one of the reasons that, that goldsilver.com exists and the YouTube channel is when I saw what was going on in the world economy back in 2000, uh, after the NASDAQ crash in, in two, the year 2000, started studying all this in 2001, I saw that there was really some imbalances and that uh, what the Federal Reserve was doing wasn't just theft and wrong, but it was very dangerous, right. putting things out of balance, causing these tremendous bubbles. And, um, and so I decided to get into this business because uh, what I, I saw was that uh, the middle class defines a nation with its vote. It's about 70% of most modern nations. And as goes the middle class, so goes the nation. And what you see in the Weimar hyperinflation, uh, you know, Hitler uh, came out of that. He gave his famous beer hall push. He was first came on the public scene in the final week of that hyperinflation. And the middle class had just lost everything. They were scared. They, uh, they didn't understand what was going on. And this uh, strong, well-spoken leader comes forward and says, it's their fault and follow me. I know the way out of this. And they, they did. And he uh, uh, did the, I can't remember the name, the beer hall, beer hall putsch, I think. Um, they did a, a uh, they tried to uh, do a coup the next day. Yeah. And it failed. He ended up in prison. Yeah, uh, that's where, and he, wrote that's where he wrote half of my half of mine comp. Right. He was supplied a secretary. Rudolf Hess, when he was in prison, they let him have a secretary. He was allowed to wear his own clothes and get visits from his dog. And he had a cell with a view. Uh, and this he was charged with uh, treason. Normally, the sentence is either life or death. <laughs> there is no in between. <laughs> he got the in between, but that's where he first gained. Uh, and then it was the next economic crisis when the Great Depression hit Germany that he was uh, propelled back on the, uh, the public scene. He was also the first politician to campaign by air, hitting multiple cities in a single day. Hmm. So he was, he was smart. Uh, he was telling people what they wanted to hear. Right, right. And so you have to be very wary of somebody telling you what you want to hear. Please step back, take a breath, watch Pale Blue Dot and investigate the person that is telling you what you want to hear. So that's uh, goldsilver.com, uh, Gold Silver Mike Maloney on YouTube, uh, Hidden Secrets of Money. Yeah. And episode five actually is about what I just talked about. Yeah. Um, Episode four, most popular video, uh, five, and I recommend eight if you want to understand how cryptocurrencies work. Uh, if you want to know what blockchain is and how blockchain works, uh, that's, this is one of the most popular videos on that. Uh, 
nine and 10, I just think my guys, Dan, Aiden, and Lincoln just did, they made masterpieces uh, in my view. It's, it's, it's their credit, not mine. I went around the world saying stuff into a camera. It was basically random stuff. It is Dan that formed stories out of this and, and made these uh, masterpieces. But they're completely scored from end to end with music. Uh, Dan picks out all of the music, puts it to the picture. Uh, he is the editor, lighting, cameraman. He wrote the story uh, and he uh, um, uh, is the producer of it. And then two full-time animators, Aiden and Lincoln. So whenever you see a 3D animation, that's Aiden Magnus. If you see a 2D animation, that's Lincoln Jude. And so it's just a three-man crew when you watch these, compare it to something that uh, is on PBS or the History Channel or something like that, and then watch the credits roll. These guys are doing what normally takes an army of 50 to 200 people to do. Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah. So anyway, thank you very much for having me. I'm glad I was on. As always, it was an incredible conversation. And I just, I, I value your time, your insight and your wisdom so much. And I'm sure my audience does as well. So yeah. Uh, just oh, keep... the reason I started Gold, Silver and Hidden Secrets of Money was to save the middle class. That is the reason. And I wanted to get as much gold and silver into the hands of the middle class before the crisis. Now that was before cryptos. I don't sell any crypto, but I do. Um, I never give recommendations. I don't give advice but I do own cryptos myself. I tell people what I do. Yeah, right. And more than half of my net worth is uh, precious metals. And I have a large portion of my net worth in, uh, in cryptos. So uh, that is what I do. Awesome, Mike. Thanks. Thanks again, my friend. Enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy that mountaintop with views of both sides of Puerto Rico. <laughs> okay, thank you.